Okay, looks like we're recording. Look who I have with us. We have the gay church lady. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> oh, most people would think that someone called a church lady would run the other way when they saw me coming. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm so excited. I, I like most of the people that I... Um, talk to with this series i found you on instagram yes and you have some really really beautiful photos on instagram i'll Thank share you. the links in the description and um so tell us about yourself sure so my name is joseph i live right outside new york city in new jersey um the gay church lady is kind of an, an evolution and a rebellion and performance art in itself. Um, so I actually am going to change my hat really fast because it kind of correlates to the story I'm going to tell. Okay. So, and I, and the hats hide my, my messy hair because I haven't had a haircut in a while. But um, when, when, I, when I was growing up, I grew up Mormon very observant, strict, religious family. Um, I grew up in Asia and there was very little programming in English. And so my mother did all the traditional crafts with us, um, quilting, and, and there's six siblings. I have two brothers and three sisters. Um, to, to keep us entertained at night, it, it was just what we did as a family. Um, all of us learned embroidery, um, you know, stuff we could do with our hands. Um, so as I progressed through life, um, I have always gone back to um, something I can tangibly do with my hands to bring me comfort and mm -hmm. to kind of process my day. Um, so I'm wearing my pride hat. I don't know if you can really see the logo on here. This is from my, it's a beaker because I'm a nerd. Um, I I, by, by training, I'm a clinical research nurse, um, you know, where, where I've actually been in the room the first time a compound's been put into a human. Um, Ten years ago, I, I transitioned out of that into the pharmaceutical industry um, and, and into patient access and support. So patients who have really rare diseases, I, I work in the oncology space, so cancer can't afford their drugs. And my, my job, or all the jobs I've had, have been to help doctors and nurses figure out how to get their patient on treatment. And so as I progressed through my career, um, you know, the past 10 years I've been traveling. Um, and so I was doing a lot of embroidery um, because I could bring it with me on a plane. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, I was actually leading a field-based team, national team, um, where I was out of the house Monday through Thursday. Um, and so the one constant I could bring with me was uh, my embroidery. So uh, I, I was working on these story dolls. Um, like this is one I made of a friend who stopped wearing the hijab, um, you know, not for religious reasons, but she's just growing. So I have the heart showing the growth. And then this is her. I, I tease her that she's kind of like the, the Arab Marie Antoinette. So um, I have, her, oops, I have her right here with, it says, let them eat cake. Um, you know, ju just teasing her, like the difference and the contrast in her experience. Um, when, when Trump was elected, I, I've always turned to art or creation to work through my emotions. So elected. Sorry, what's that? Elected in elected. air quotes. Yes. yes anyway, right. moving right along. When he was installed by the Russians, let's be real. Um, but but I was so shocked at the misogyny that went on when Hillary Clinton was our candidate. Um, and and so I, I picked up this doll form that I that I somebody had gifted me and immediately just started um, working on images of women and labels women get the front of the doll. Um, sorry, I'm getting used to where the camera is. Uh, really, the, the course that represents the constraints that society put on women to conform to what they want them to be. And then you have this fig leaf apron, which represents the figs that Eve put over herself when she, you know, allegedly brought us all into a sinful world. Um, I purposely made the leaves almost look vagina-like because I wanted it to 
be in your face almost. So really this was the first um, true feminist piece I would say that I worked on. Um, but but I have all sorts of women on here and you know I, I, I thought like something that that we've always loved are, are sexy hot black women with big boobs as long as they don't have opinions. Um, you know and, and so I just started putting the labels. Um, you know, I have here the Virgin Mary, you know, our, our, our lady um, here, Ashley Longshore. I don't know if you're familiar with this artist. If you're not, you should definitely look her up. She's, she is a plus size. People told her she's crazy. She never accomplished anything. Um, and she went and did it. Um, Amanda Lapore is on the other sleeve. Um, down here, I have uh, my good friend who's um, Dean of Graduate Studies at Art Institute of Chicago and her wife participating in the pussy hat um, rallies. Um, you know, I, I put Hillary on there, of course, being called nasty. Um, be, because I, you know, I, it was just so shocking that in 20, what, what year was he like? 2016, we were still talking about women as sluts and cunts and bitches. And, and, and you know, all those words might have a place sometimes. But, but the thing that made me most most confused was this is Melania Trump and I and I'm saying it how her husband would like me to with an American accent and, and their child. Um, you know, here here he is calling women all these horrible names, saying let's grab them by their pussies, let's violate them. But his wife, who's a former porn stress, is the mother figure. I mean, it's just such classic bullshit of of men controlling the narrative of women. And I say that as a man creating feminist pieces. So when it's, 20... it's yeah, it, it's true. And, you know, I, I have one of the things that I've done in the past is as an opera blogger, and I have been in contact with a number of um, composers and one person wrote um, a set of, it's a composition based on on speeches by Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is brilliant. Brilliant. There is no doubting that. But the fact that she does not have a penis mm -hmm. is her curse. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's interesting that even for her, she needed to wear a pantsuit to portray power instead of something more feminine. And, and I've noticed like, even as she walked away from, you know, when she lost the election, um, walked away from directly running for office, she started dressing more feminine. Lost Yes. Election. When the election was stolen from her, you and I probably agree on that. So, so I really, um, you know, that was, that was my react, my guttural reaction. Um, 2020 came and, and the pandemic hit and um, you know, my husband and I actually were, were bound for Morocco March 14th of 2020 and canceled our plans less than 24 hours before we left. And I, I looked at him and I said, this thing's probably going to be a month or two. And, and remember at the time I'm leading this, this national field team traveling Monday through Thursday. And I'm thinking, what's my team going to do even you know, you know, what am I going to do? I haven't been home like this r really in 10 years almost or, or nine years at the time. And um, so I said, I'm going to buy a sewing machine from Costco um, because I'd always wanted to learn how to quilt. Um, my mother is an amazing quilter with a skill set I'll never possess. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I um, bought this machine and I stared at it for about probably about a month. And then right around the middle of April, I opened the box and just started teaching myself how to um, do these quilts. I started, you know, I'd had all this fabric because for years I had wanted to learn how to quilt and, and I, uh, and with my hoarding tendencies, you know, who doesn't love to go shopping for something exciting like fabric. Um, but, but so I used what I had um, and I, and then, and then a coworker said, you've got to join these Facebook groups, so, um, they'll answer your questions and, and you'll have so much fun. And, 
and blah, blah, blah. And, and really wonderful coworker, nothing bad to say about her. But I got into those Facebook groups and saw the matriarchy who are the wives of the patriarchy keeping the rest of us in line. Don't be too feminine. Don't be, you know, for a man. Don't, don't be too gay. You know, it's okay that you're gay, but as long as it's palatable and you don't throw it in our face, it's kind of bullshit. Um, you know, and I saw them squashing other women. Um, and so my initial response was to start putting comments on all the posts like, hey, girl, and and really just gay it up as much as I can to just kind of agitate a little because um, it, it was just so puzzling to me that, um, that, that, that this was going on and, you know, that it, that this, this craft form was really so political and um then black lives matter happened and boy boy the the clan the, the ku klux klan's hoods came out and, and those 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 sweet southern women and and women and it's not even the southern women because honestly some of the most liberal quilters i know are in the south but these women showed their true colors of hate and it was so puzzling to me um and, and I think that's when my quilting started, I started looking at ways to, to get activism and um, really put it in their face. That there are other people who matter that aren't white and heterosexual, heterosexual and Christian. Do you know, I, I, I myself have not seen it. Maybe I have just been blind to it. Mm -hmm people i know have seen it in the yarn community yeah there is a white supremacist sub community within the yarn mm -hmm. community um that i haven't seen yeah. yet i yeah, probably it's... will mm -hmm. but i haven't seen it yet and they uh, and everyone is appalled yeah. It's, it's so subtle. And I think like, um, for, for me, um, you know, maybe I'm more conscious of it. Um, because at the time, well, I, that couldn't part, but at the time I was working for, in a consulting group that was, our leadership was heavily Southern Baptist, African American women. And my company encourage those conversations about microaggressions and and um you know the inherent white supremacist culture in in america um mm -hmm. i remember you know one of my one of my closest friends many years ago called me out of my white privilege um and i was so offended because i, I hadn't even really heard about all this and um you know i i, I do have some 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 mixed heritage you know, technically on paper, I'm Mexican American, but I'm white. And, um, and, and he's half Japanese. And he said, no, you got white privilege, man. Like, you don't know what it's like to be a racial minority. Um, not in America, I don't. But I grew up with going to in, in Asia with people who didn't look like me. Um, when I was five years old, I came home from school crying because the kids in the grade ahead of me had, had, um, formed a circle around me and pushed me and said, called me a white boy. And I said to my mom, did you know I'm white? <laughs> because I didn't know race as an innocent mm -hmm. child. Um, and, you know, it took me a long time to accept that I do have white privilege. And then to start looking for ways as I, as I was leading other people and even as a colleague that I could leverage my white privilege to help other people and open doors. Do you know, I, th I think it's uh, possible that, as as gay men particularly of our generation mm -hmm. i'm probably older i'm sure i'm older than you or i'm <laughs> older than dirt but um <clears throat> you know we we learned to question the status quo mm -hmm. the, we we learned to just look at things the way they were accepted in the popular culture yeah. of the time that we came up with. Mm -hmm. So we, um, I'm still learning ways in Same which here. I see white privilege. You yeah. know, 
I'm an educated white man. Mm -hmm. I'm not straight. I don't have that advantage. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, there are so many advantages that I do enjoy that I don't even know. Yeah. And I don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that, that at least, at least we have that understanding mm -hmm. where so many, um, so many people of our generation, especially, mm -hmm. um, and and earlier generations yeah. are just clueless. They don't understand. Yeah. They don't know what privilege is. No. And I've I've seen it. It's not only with race. It's with mm -hmm. you know. It's with socioeconomics. You know, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it, I've it, seen it with looksism. I've seen mm -hmm. it with 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 body shape. Yeah. I've seen it with um, everything. It, it's um, othering people. Yeah. Ex I like that verb, yeah. othering. Yeah. Yes, I, I actually learned it from my my works, uh, gay gay pride group, um, which is the the most militant one I've ever been involved with. Um, but but I I think David, to your point, like I have so much to learn still. Um, we all know, my, do. My, my Every one of us does, and I think if we yeah. if we stop learning, then that's when we start dying. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think of my husband who is an immigrant to the U.S. He's Chinese. Um, and, and you know, we love Asia. We have a small business where, where we, we go over to source things in Thailand prior to the pandemic a couple times a year. We just spent the holidays there for the first time in two years, which was magical. Um, but when we come back into the U.S., anything that he thinks that no, and we're not bringing contraband. We're not running drugs. We're not running jewels or anything like that. But stuff as simple as snacks that we like to buy at 7-Eleven in Thailand and bring home because we can't find them here, I'll go in my luggage because he says, you're white. <laughs> they won't question you the way they'll question me. Mm, I, I, I get that, you know? yeah. And, and it's unfortunate. I mean, he's been in the U.S. longer than I have. So, so it's, it's crazy, right? That, that that's the world we live in, but um, really thinking back to, you know, the, the racism and homophobia that I've seen in the craft communities online. Um, I think it's very subtle. It's, it's nuanced usually. Um, I, I've gotten personally had messages um, on Facebook saying like, why are you making gay quilts? Why, why are you making uh, quilts with African-American geisha girls? Because that's what I initially started doing. And, you know, my response back is, why wouldn't I? And, and you need to look at yourself and ask yourself, why does that even bother you? Um, because if you, if you really pause and, and, and look at why something bothers you, you might have a realization that, that the way you see the world, there's room for change. I, it, it's interesting. It's 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 especially within the yarn community, we expect a level of acceptance because mm -hmm. we've seen a level yeah. of acceptance and love, um, and then there are people who really they do intend mm -hmm. to be loving. But yeah. they say things that they don't realize mm -hmm. uh, show. I don't know what to, how to describe it. Show yeah. a, a level of ignorance. Yeah. I mean, I'm still getting questions like, are you gay? And I'm going, <laughs> hello? Have you heard my speaking voice? It's like the, the purse fell out of my mouth when I opened it. Come on. I mean, really? <laughs> And then that that's and then I get people telling me, "Oh, it's okay," and I'm going <laughs> that, you, that you're gay, and I'm going. It's like I I figured that out when I came out. <laughs> yeah, why wouldn't it be? And you know, <laughs> I have gay friends, and I'm going. Yeah, so do I. And yeah. you know, it's it's 
they they and I know their intention yeah is there mm -hmm. but but their expression shows a level of 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 ignorance and yeah. you know it's sometimes you have to determine where the intention mm -hmm. and the expression are separated yeah. and and it's okay when that happens but it, mm -hmm. it, it if the expression and the intention are both not so nice mm -hmm. and i think i've been fortunate there yeah. where i haven't seen very much of that mm -hmm. Um, that's when the claws come out. Yeah. You know, I, it's interesting. Cause I think as like, I came out when I was 26, um, it was a journey for my family. They're amazing. Um, we, we have a fantastic relationship. My, you know, we had to work on that, um, coming from such a conservative religion and, and it's not just religion, it's a culture. And I, I think of my evolution personally, um, you know, 26 years old, I was militant. You were going to accept me no matter what. I thought I had to be more flamboyant than was actually natural to me. Um, you know, and this is early 2000s. I did them right, pink hair, and I was like heroin chic, 120 pounds, you know, 100 pounds lighter than I am now, and, and, and the little glitter at the bar, that twink that walked in cute and everything, because that's what I felt the gay community expected of me. And I felt like that's how I could make sure people knew I was gay and just left me alone. And, and there was this expectation from the Mormon community to abandon everything that I had grown up with culturally. And that I had, you, you know, because you're gay, so you must be immoral. And, and you can't believe in God the way we believe in God. And there's no way, you know, you're going straight to hell now, although Mormons don't have hell, but the lowest level of, uh, of heaven, whatever. And it really took me so many years to, to unwind from that. Um, you know, and, and when I really feel like I figured it out was during the pandemic to some degree, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because I think like so many other people, I was searching for what brought me comfort. And at the end of the day, it's casseroles cooking, <laughs> you know, the church lady casseroles. It's the cakes my mom made from, you know, from a Duncan Hines box because she knows how to gussy up any of those things. Um, and, and it was quilting. Or which, Betty Crocker on a good day. Yeah. 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 It's a, you uh, know, exactly. it's a, it's a, yeah. It, 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 all these things that are traditional pieces of conservative Christian culture that we've been told we can't have. That, that there are heritage too. And that's when I was like, you know what? I'm the gay church lady because I'm reclaiming my heritage and I want others to reclaim it too. Do you have that uh, Better, Home, Better Homes and Gardens cookbook with the, uh, it's in a binder that it mimics a pink gingham fabric? Yes. I have that and I have a Campbell's soup casserole book from the 1950s was pretty amazing um yeah I, I have a number of of different ones and then my friend laura laura ost if you hear this you're amazing one of the friends i met on instagram sent me a lutheran church lady cookbook from the 1980s that was her mother's mm, so and, and yeah. she wrote notes in there about which ones were her favorite recipes and why so so really like that's when um i decided to make my name on instagram the gay church lady I think um, that's great. I think that's great. And, and yeah. you know, speaking about the, those cultural roles that we think are already defined for mm -hmm. us, you know, I, I, I had the struggle too, because, you know, I was a fat boy in a Southern football culture. Mm -hmm. I was the gay boy. I, uh, in a Southern football culture, <laughs> you know, I, I, I begged at, in whenever, uh, uh, like if I finished a test early 
in class or if there was like a substitute and we had study hall instantly i begged for passes to go to the choir room so that i could just play the piano and i i didn't care what i had i would pull whatever there was in the file cabinet out and just play it because that was me yeah that was what i was and in Monroe, North Carolina, there wasn't a role for me to yeah. model or to me mm -hmm. for, for me to mimic. Yeah. Um, and then, thank God, I don't know where I got the balls to do this, but I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to, to whatever. And, well, in North Carolina, you can't swing a cat without hitting a small um, church-related <laughs> liberal arts college. Okay. And I was lucky to find one that had a really good choral music cool. tradition. Mm -hmm. So I learned a tremendous uh, a lot about music, music history, music mm -hmm. literature, vocal literature. I had really horrible vocal instruction there but that's beside the point um <laughs> even though i wanted to become an opera singer uh by the time i was done <laughs> but um you know it's you have to uh, I, I there are so many young people even today mm -hmm. um when people it's much easier I hope it is mm -hmm. for young people to find their way to find what works for them. Yeah. It's still so hard mm -hmm. to find where exactly they belong, where exactly they fit. Yeah, that's and that's where I for for my sub community of gay people, gay Mormons the suicide rate is extremely high, especially in teenagers to this day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I feel it's so important to be in your face <laughs> and, and out. Um, and, and, you know, I, I tag most of my posts, gay Mormon, hoping that some of these kids will find it. And, and, and not that my life's perfect by any means, but see like, you can still be Mormon culturally and gay. And you don't have to throw away everything that you grew up with that makes you who you are. Like who can ever truly separate their childhood from their adulthood and from who they are? Nobody. It influences how we were raised. Influences, exactly. Period. And I think anyone who thinks that, the, that they can is probably fooling himself but that's what that's what we're told to do when when we come out as mormons uh, it, not just gay mormons but when when a mormon leaves the religion you're no longer considered mormon if a catholic mm -hmm. stops going to church they're still catholic but mormons don't have that and i think it's like for for my subgroup and really it's not just my subgroup because i've con i have connected with so many amazing people on instagram um from born again christian backgrounds or mm -hmm. very weird, different ver i was gonna say weird but that's rude i'm on other different versions of catholicism mm -hmm. you know that 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 what i'm doing resonates with um you know we don't have to throw away our grandmother's recipes because we aren't following their religion anymore <laughs> you know it, it, exactly i come up from a Nowadays, they would call it mainstream Protestant. Mm -hmm. I call it homogenized Protestant yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, tradition. I was Methodist and Presbyterian. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so um, it's in my blood. I cannot mm -hmm. escape it. The music. Do you sing those hymns when you need comfort? Do they? Oh, hell you? yeah! Yeah, the same oh, year. Oh my God! Same and year. and and um. <laughs> when I 
get started thinking about some of that music. Mm -hmm. It really just gets me going. Yeah. Because also, in addition to that kind of a faith background, mm -hmm. I have the music thing. Yeah. Where, you know, knowing choral music, mm -hmm. knowing what choral music has meant through the ages, mm -hmm. knowing what it meant to Bach, mm -hmm. knowing what it meant to Martin Luther, yeah. knowing what it meant to Pachel Bell mm -hmm. and, you know, Thomas Tallis and William Byrd and all of these people and mm -hmm. having and done all of this amazing church music mm -hmm. um i recently on one of my blogs i, I have three different blogs which okay. should surprise no one <laughs> really you know one of them is crochet one of them is opera and one of them is general topics mm -hmm. so um at my school um I, I was a music education major, but most of my classmates were church music majors. Okay, yeah, cool. And so um, the um, the big, the primary uh, senior level course was church music administration. Mm -hmm. And that culminated in like a huge essay on, you know, uh, basically is what church music means to me cool more quotes yeah yeah and so recently i wrote a blog post about that and um it means a shit ton to me mm -hmm. it does and and i can't escape it it's yeah. in my blood you, you know it it's as you're talking i was thinking why why do those hymns bring us comfort when um, I mean, I, I don't know your story, but I know I I, I, I left the religion 20 years ago. Um, wow, only 20, maybe 22. I don't remember. Anyways, a while ago. And, and I was thinking, like, it's probably what our mother is saying to us to comfort us as children and infants. And it's what we, what we felt when we were in a place of worship because music, art, you know, art, art, like hearing and sight – are our senses and and you know it's why it's why the greatest art in europe and even in asia is in places of worship exactly because that's something exactly. that religions feed into um, and is, you know is and, in auditory in in the middle ages you know when you came up on a town when you found the biggest the tallest building you would mm -hmm. find what those people worshipped yep most of the time it's going to be a, a cathedral yeah nowadays unfortunately in america it's going to be a sports stadium <laughs> so but true. um but then you just reminded me about you know infancy um my mother taught for like taught school for about 400 years mm -hmm. and um so uh, even as soon as i was uh, uh i don't know a year old maybe she was back at school teaching and we had a babysitter we had one woman continuously for mm, two or three years and okay. so we ha we have very very fond memories mm -hmm. of her so now I have to ask my sister if she has any memories of what that one woman sang to us, if she ever did, mm -hmm. because that would be really good to know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I grew up in the church. I was always in kitty choirs. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, always in every other kind of choir I could get myself into. It's awesome. So. I mean, I, I I sort of feel like we've gotten. I don't think that the direction where our conversation has gone 
is bad. But, you know, I am sort of a craft channel. I know, right? Uh -huh. ah. Should you want to talk I, talk about craft? So, so I I bring this stuff up because I think it, it's it's what leads to my my craft. Of course, and I of course. And um, really, like when I'm doing it, it's to process my own emotions, but it's also to tell a story. And um, that's what um, you know. These quilts all all tell different stories. This this. Um, I guess I can show you one that's my first strong women quilt. Grab this. So, so this this is the the first strong women quilt that I worked on, um, and I didn't really. It's a very basic quilt prop pattern called um, courthouse steps, um, along with just some some patchwork filler in here, and this was mainly using images that I found um, on Spoonflower or of women that I just found um, on websites or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, some of it was sent to me, like suddenly people started saying, hey, I want to send some images to you for you to use in your quilt project. So mm. this was sent from my friend Emily in Kentucky. Um, and then I started getting packages too of beautiful scrap fabric. Um, there, there's this cool program on, um, or, or a thing that we do in the quilting community, uh, in October called Quilty Wishes, which is where I met one of my closest friends now, Dell. So Dell, if you're watching, um, she's amazing. She lives in Alabama in law enforcement. Um, she actually finishes the quilts for me, but, um, she sends me her scraps from projects because a lot of quilters don't want to, aren't interested in doing scrappy projects. They want more of the matching stuff, which is very beautiful. Um, so anyways, um, the reason I chose this block, A, it was simple, but it was mm -hmm. also because I wanted, I feel like it's like, here's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I feel like the courthouse steps are so meaningful because it's like women finding their voices and it's, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to build it out as I chose the fabrics to really show like them amplifying their voices. So you know, this piece is smaller, then it gets bigger, and then bigger progressively. Um, and and I tried to look at, you know, at the time I had such limited access to um, fabric because you couldn't, everybody was sewing masks, so there was a shortage. So you would wait months and months, and so these scraps people were sending me were amazing. But, like, for instance, this block I did of Ruth, sorry, trying to get it on camera, Notice there's bananas here. And it's really to show all the cocks, people that try to cock block her, all the men that wanted to keep her in her place. Um, and that she just broke through those barriers. And 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 she 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 just stayed fast in the fight. Um, you know, so that's so I, I don't know. Um here I have Elizabeth Warren as well, some artist on Instagram did this awesome image of her. Um, or not Instagram on um, Spoonflower, and again I, I I put the bananas there as well. But then I wanted to contrast it with this feminine, you know, because you have this very strong image of a female politician because she's got up here mm -hmm. and in Butch and uh, it looks like a rosy river, rosy the river uh, yes, it's a, it's image, a, yeah, a rosy yeah. River, you know. But I wanted um, to also show like the feminine yeah. because I think we need to start accepting the feminine. Um, and that there is strength in the feminine. Uh, there's, you know, well, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And and so that's really the story of this first quilt I did. It features Kamala um, Harris as well. Um, Do you know, I approached her, or at least I sent an email asking to interview her for my channel. Of course, oh, they haven't heard yeah. back. She's probably a busy <laughs> lady. Yes, but, I'm sure. Um, Anyway, I know she crochets. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. She does. She does. But, you know, about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I used to go to this, I, I, and I want to go back. Um, every year when I was in New York, I would go to the Glimmerglass Festival up in Cooperstown. I don't know if you've heard of I'm it. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, it's uh, amazing. I was going to put a swear word in there, but it's amazing. Um Anyway, she was a patron because um, 
Francesca Zambello is the general director of Glimmer Glass and is also the general director of the Washington Opera in oh, wow. uh, okay. DC. So that's how they began their association. And there were times when I would be in the audience and Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be escorted into her place in the audience. Wow. And get us. Standing ovation just for being her. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, don't apologize. I mean, how, how amazing to, sit, to to witness that. I know. There were also times she would do programs where they would show operatic scenes that featured, you know, different things about the law. And that would be fascinating too. Mm -hmm. But just seeing her in the audience. Yeah. Moving right along. <laughs> no, I, you know, you're fine. It's, it, it's uh, obviously, it would be a very powerful thing to see. Well, I can cry at the drop of a hat. So. <laughs> and I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks about it because that's what I am now. Yeah. No, there's no, no, no shame in that whatsoever. I think, um, you know, going back to the theme, it, it's in Western society, we've said men can't cry because that's what women do. Well, fuck them. <laughs> I, mean, that's, I don't care what they say. Uh, that's, that, that's what we've been raised to think. And, and our society is decided when, when to me, like, well, guess what? Really, if yeah. they come, they come. Society also told me I was too fat and ugly to ever have a girlfriend, which, you know, I thought I wanted at the time. But <laughs> you know what? I'm not. <laughs> you just didn't want a girlfriend. Well, there, there's that true. Uh, <laughs> I also had a loving partner of 14 years too wow. so that's awesome yeah yeah so so really like um i think the social justice component of my work is important but but something that i've tried to do which isn't in this quilt so much is look for strong women in all walks of life um for for instance um a quilt that i did that's now hanging at art institute of chicago or the School of the Art Institute of Chicago um, features, you know, Liz Cheney, of all people. Why, you know, and some of my followers are like, why would you choose Liz Cheney to put in one of your quilts? Well, what? I can see why. Yeah, honestly, I, I I can. I mean, aside from her heritage mm -hmm. and her necessary allegiance. Yes. She is a very strong. She's strong. Woman. She's strong. And and I think of a conversation I had with one of one of my my dear friends who who's conservative, and my friend Rachel, um, as as I was working on these projects and and just about like many social justice issues. And she and I were talking, and I had this realization that the liberal left, and I definitely lean liberal. I don't consider myself a liberal. Liberal. I'm an independent. But, oh, um, hell, I'm a bleeding heart liberal. And yeah, I don't care who knows I, I, it. it depends on the topic. Um, social justice issues, that type of stuff, definitely bleeding heart liberal, but other stuff, I'm uh, fiscally conservative. But, but you know, I um, realized that... I don't think that's a contradiction. No, I don't think it is either. But, but, but I think there's like um, this perception or this narrative that if you're liberal, like women are strong and women's rights, women's rights, women's rights. When I find... When I think of strong women, some of the strongest women I know are Mormon, 
and Muslim and very conservative. And, and I look at the strength of somebody like Liz Cheney to stand down her whole party. Like, I don't like Liz Cheney, okay? I don't like the way she voted when Trump was president. I think she should have been louder about her opinions on him. I think they all should have. I think shame on them for not being Americans and just being Republicans. And But, but for her, it took incredible strength to, to this day to be like, you know what? I don't care if you remove me from my seat of power in the party. Like I have to, she finally woke up and became an American again. And, and that to me, I can respect, um, you know, in that quilt too, that, that I made from, for my friend, Alinda, um, I, I included Mormon women who have, were muzzled like pi, the, from, from our pioneer heritage, you know, from the founding of the church. You know, we had a we had a prophetess that that wrote most of the Mormon central hymns, who was married to Joseph Smith and and you know was was pushed down the steps by his his first wife when she found out she was pregnant. She miscarried, so there's a dead baby myth and all this other stuff. But but nobody today talks about this woman who was considered a prophetess in her day, because prophet is male. The ability to to speak with God for everybody is is male. And I look at this woman, Eliza R. Snow, um, you know, she never married again. Um, she's, her brother became a prophet, a few prophets after Joseph Smith, um, but she enjoyed great influence and power. And, and um, while she's revered, I don't know that she's revered for who she really was versus for being subordinate to men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I, I look at like the children's organization the Mormons have, which is founded by two sister wives who shared the same bed and never let their husband in it for 40 years and wrote passionately about their love for each other. They're lesbians. I mean, come on. And, 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 and uh, you know, I, I put them in there because that's, that's again, another like heterosexual washing of history. Um. And, and, a, and a denial of the influence of these strong women. Like I and, and, they were strong, and, and, had to figure out how to work within this misogynistic um, gerontocracy. You know? and, and there's this normalist type thing where there's this, this monogam, this, this, this one man, one woman kind of mm -hmm. model thing going on where anything else is absolutely wrong mm -hmm. cannot possibly be right mm -hmm. um i'm not saying that some of the um incidents uh we've seen mm -hmm. are completely right but yeah. i'm 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 not uh i would not say that there is only one relationship model yeah. that is valid yeah, I, you know, it's it's interesting. It's like I, I have opinions on polygamy. I, I come from some of the biggest polygamous families. Um, you know, it's it's what it was. And, and finally, the Mormons are, are owning it <laughs> instead of pretending like it never happened. And we're supposed to only talk to each other about it, um, you know, because it's our heritage. Like how many when I was at Brigham Young University, my alma mater, there were like four other guys that had the same name as me because we had the same common ancestor you know and and not surprising and, and my I, sister I, has, a, has a family name too so i i know if i meet another suzette that's mormon we we have we come from the same polygamous heritage um but but i think it's it's fascinating but but really like i i we could talk forever about this stuff and and and, and i i know your your blog is about crafting so so what else do you want me to talk but about honestly this is this is even more fascinating i mean we could talk about Yarn, 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 yarn. <laughs> you know, blah, blah, woof, woof. Everybody does yarn, yeah. at least in my world. Um, mm -hmm. But this I find a lot more fascinating because I love social history. Yeah. When I was in school, I hated history because it was always political history. It's, it's white <laughs> and And war history. And I didn't give a flying anything about mm -hmm. that but you know um since then um a lot of what we see on 
in uh, entertainment and uh, social media um, regarding history is really more about social history. And mm -hmm. that is what fascinates me. Yeah. I, I, I find it fascinating too. Uh, my first degree is actually in medical anthropology, mm -hmm. um, you know, modern culture, modern, the study of modern culture. Um, it, it's just what drives us. And to me, like what I'm doing with my quilting and, and with the dolls and, and I do mosaic because, because I, I, I like dabbling in lots of stuff, but, but really it's always come down to telling a story and conveying a message. And um, when I look at the feed that I have on on social media, um, you know, primarily Instagram is, is my poison of choice. Um, but but really, it's it's about telling a story. Um, it might be my story. It might be somebody mm -hmm. else's story. And, and my hope is like sharing that story um, as I've come to accept myself and to reclaim my cultural heritage um, will encourage others to do the same well ideally through social media and other channels mm -hmm. someone will find some identification especially if it's somebody who has not found that before yeah because you know it's especially for young people mm -hmm. even though they have exposure to such a wide array of different social media mm -hmm. channels it's all the same yeah yeah so if they find a voice that resonates for them then i think that it's really good for you know them. it's it's i i agree completely it's interesting because you you focus on our, the next generation or the younger kids i think i have more followers that are older than me. I mean, I'm 47. Oh, um, I know or, I do. Or, or in I'm my group, but, yeah. but, but I think of one of my, I call her pin pals, um, is a lady who's 83 years old in rural Canada, um, left the Mormon church a few years ago. Somehow, I probably through the gay Mormon hashtag found me. And, you know, we, we communicate very often now, almost daily, just sharing memes or how you doing, whatever. Um, but she shared with me that she, seeing my feed and what I'm doing with quilting and the cooking and everything, was the first time she felt like she didn't have to give everything up since she left the religion. She's 83 years old. That's, to me, that's when I feel the clamped, right? I feel like um, that's when I feel sadness for her. Um but happiness too, that she's reclaiming her heritage, reclaiming who she is, um, you know, that, that, that she, that, that in some way I helped her do that. Um, I, you know, I, I think that is, awesome. that is both ennobling and humbling. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy to me. It's, um, it's huge. Yeah. It's, it, it's amazing. And there are people out there, who have that experience in the yarn community. I mean, we talk about it a lot, especially yeah. with men in yarn, mm -hmm. because I mean, it's almost a trope now where people say, oh yeah, mm -hmm. in, in wartime, you know, soldiers, yeah. they would knit their own socks, mm -hmm. blah, blah, woof, woof. And I'm going, yeah and it's one of those trades or professions mm -hmm. that, or skills that started out as something that men would do and then when they got bored with it they passed it on to women <laughs> um which is true okay well, i'm just that's fine um um and then um at the same time I, I hope that people are seeing, oops, I'm sorry. I keep, I, I keep moving my table a little bit. Yeah. See my, oops, there it is. My subscribe little sign. Yep. Yep. My friend Brenta, the newbie crocheter did that for me. Aww. Anyway, that's a hint. P 
people, if you're watching. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so yeah, it's um, uh, uh, where was I going with this? You never know when I start talking. Hey, me either. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 the identification. I mm -hmm. think the identification is there. The um, I th I've told this story before. I, I I knew someone. I've lost touch with her now. Uh, she was an is probably still is an art therapist working okay. with at risk youth. Awesome. She taught uh, some of them to crochet. How cool. And some of the toughest boys would be the most mm -hmm. proud of the mm -hmm. little caps and the hats they would create for themselves. Yeah. And she would tell stories about them just crowing about them mm -hmm. because they were so proud of what they had produced. There's something magical about creating and creating something that you have complete control over. Um, you know, that, that, that other people's opinions, if you want them to matter, they do, but they don't have to like, um, technically, exactly. you, you know, my, my quilts, I, I, I've never read a quilt pattern. I'm sure I could figure it out, but I just look at a picture and go, that looks really interesting. I'm going to make my version of it. Um, you know, because it's fun. And, and for me, like I have perfectionistic tendencies Quilting for me is the one hobby where I'm like, I'm not going to be perfect unless it's really horrible. I'm not ripping it apart because mm. that was what came out of the moment when I was making it. Now, let me ask you about your quilts. Are they meant to be ornamental or are they meant to be used? Um, they're meant to be used. Um, so they are, some people would say more ornamental, but to me, it's like whatever you want to do with it, do with it. Um, I don't sell them. Um, you know, the, the, um, I don't know what I'm doing with them so far. I've donated one to my company. I work for an oncology pharmaceutical company. We had a, a, an auction and it raised 1700 around there, which was awesome. My cousin is doing the AIDS cycle ride out in floor in um, California. So they're going to raffle. Oh, really? Yeah, you so, know, my friend uh, Gary Boston is doing a knit along, crochet along. Um, actually, he's doing a cycle of four through the coming year oh, cool. to raise money for that very same awesome. AIDS ride. Yeah. And he's using one of my patterns. Oh, I really? am Congratulations. so excited about that. Yeah. So, so that's where I really hope they start going. Um, is towards organizations that can use them for fund raising funds. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a hobby for me. I don't want it to be a money maker. Um, I, I've had my artwork in galleries before and whatever. And when it becomes about the money, my creativity is sapped completely. Um, and I don't enjoy it anymore. So, um, you know, I, I'm making strong women quilts for my nieces, um, hoping that it inspires them. My niece, my one of my older nieces actually just sent me a picture of the one I gave her uh, in her dorm room at Brigham Young University. Yes. Um, you know, uh, sh she's pretty liberal, but but still like I'm hoping that it just inspires them. And and, and really um, when I think of the next generation of strong women, it's my nieces mm -hmm. and I believe in them and I want them to be boss ladies. I want them to be bossy. I want them to be loud. I, I want them to know that whatever they choose to do, they can do. Um, and, and that's really like, when I think of the next generation, that's, that's where my mind goes. Um, but, but anyways, there's that. So that's, that's my long answer for what do I do with these quilts or are they ornamental or, or, or useful? Once I, once I'm done with them, whatever somebody wants to do with it, it's up to them. <laughs> so. Well, my primary reason for asking that is I have, a lovely patchwork quilt that my parents bought for me from uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch country. Oh, wow. and, um, mm -hmm. But I, uh, when I started putting it on my bed and using it every night, it got a little frayed. Oh, huh. 
Yeah. So um, I didn't know what to do next. It's probably it's probably in a box right now. I don't know where yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. People hang them and use them as artwork. I mean, they're beautiful. Yeah. So. It it would have been a beautiful piece of artwork. Yeah. Yeah. And it probably well, still could be. I, I if I could find the box where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. But um. Yeah, that's that that's quite interesting. So then, um, uh, what do you see as the future in your crafting life? So, what do I see as a future? A revolution. Um, one of the things that has been so cool that I, that I touched on a little bit is just um, connecting with people, and um, and and how many people have been so generous without me even asking have said I want to send you scraps or I want to send you images to use, um, and then I've actually sent kits out to other people to get them started doing their own versions. Um, as far as way as Australia, I have uh, one going kit little kit I'm sending down to Chile. Um, you know. I really just want, hope that um, people, this is just an idea I had, but I hope that we use our creative energy for activism, um, whatever that creative energy may be. And that we, we really, those of us who have been othered um, by our re religions of origin or, or our cultures of origin, that we reclaim those, those things that bring us happiness and, mm -hmm. and that we own our heritage and that we don't allow the matriarchy and the patriarchy to, to take that away from us because it is ours as much as it is theirs. You know, so. and as we've been speaking right now, I've been thinking of ways that I could craft uh, to, I mean, I've, I've, I've always been doing it to be, uh, I've always done a lot to benefit others. I refuse to sell my stuff because yeah. I'm not going to bargain with people. Mm -mm. You know, if you want, if you want Walmart prices, go to Walmart. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but um, um, I have to keep. I, I have a. Some people talk about a, a, a whip mountain. They they refer to like a mountain oh, range as, as yeah the whip Alachians. <laughs> um i have a a finished object mountain um but i i have to keep a lot of that stuff because i want to get new photographs because i want to publish uh more stuff yeah. with the same patterns but then on the other hand there are other things that that i have and other things that i could easily just whip up that i'm thinking could benefit some of my favorite um, causes, if I just yeah. shove them to them and say, just sell them, mm -hmm. do what you're going to do. Yeah. It's on you. Yeah. Yeah. I saw an, um, an interesting um, idea in one quilting forum where, where a lady said, you know, I want to make quilts for kids that are coming out, which I thought was nice. I, I don't know that I'm there yet. Um, because I, you know, I have so many nephews and nieces. I want to make stuff for, for, for those people. But I think there's something that says, you know, when I think of handmade and think of my mom who, who anybody she's met has probably received something handmade from her, whether it's food or, or crafts, but there's something that says, I love you in a different way when something is handmade. I'm thinking something you can't really do something in a generalized way. Well, you can, but if you mm -hmm. did in a generalized way for kids who are coming out, it wouldn't have as much meaning. Yeah. Whereas if you knew the, the mm -hmm. person as an individual, then you could do something yeah. that, that, whereas I could, I can do baby blankets in my sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or or throws or something like that, mm -hmm. and I could like, I could like give it, send a package. They wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah, they, they, because they're stupid. <laughs> the 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 friends of music at my at my alma mater. <laughs> I could say, sell these things. 
for kids to use in their dorm rooms as throws or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm torn because you know you go to Goodwill, you see a bunch of stuff that people have, uh, yeah. a bunch of crafted stuff. That yeah, I actually um, just received new labels I ordered because I mm -hmm. one of the ones that my my bestie Dell had designed for me. Um, and on the back of my label, I put, if you um, decide you don't want this, please return it to me. Um, you know, just hoping that that um, people recognize how much work it is. But but more than that, if you, if you don't appreciate it anymore, that's okay. Or if you don't like it and I gifted it to you, it's okay. Um, just just hand it back to me and I'll find a home for it. Most of the time when I send out a gift, I say, you know, if it doesn't work for you, then just pass it on to somebody else. I'm yeah. okay with that. I'd yeah. rather see it used. Yeah. Now, um, I, you know, I come from an opera world and I've been flattered to have some of my operatic friends um, post pictures with things that I, I have crocheted and sent to them. Oh, wow. That's cool. Um, didn't get any, you know, YouTube subscribers <laughs> or any or pattern sales out of it but at the same time it was nice attention yeah yeah um but uh, you know you want your stuff i don't want my stuff well in the first place i'm never gonna argue about price no the either. price is the price mm -hmm. if i'm gonna sell it well, I'm not going to sell it in the first place, but if I want to sell it, the price is the price. Absolutely, 100%. I think that I wish people were doing that across the board. Yeah, I mean, they're making their own work. There's a song going around on TikTok or YouTube or whatever. You know, it costs so much because it, uh, it took me fucking hours. <laughs> well, I think of like... Um, like this quilt, people always ask me, how many hours did it take you? I have no idea, but these are tiny pieces. Um, what I can tell you is it probably took me longer than it took some artists to, to get some watercolor and splash it around. And they're selling that for 5000 and nobody's telling them that it's too expensive. And to me, or, you know, there, yeah, there's a guy who I don't want to diminish the value of his art, artwork. He puts a canvas on a drill. He squirts mm -hmm. oil paint on mm -hmm. the canvas and j then spins the drill. Yeah. That's and cool. I've seen the, it. <laughs> the, the result is his artwork. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is really beautiful. Yeah. I don't want to diminish the value of that. Mm -hmm. It takes me a whole lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sweater that I'm wearing right now, the reason I'm wearing it is because uh, a couple of days ago I wore it on a live stream and people were just over the beautiful. moon about the this particular collar uh, because it's a turtleneck. This sweater pattern, which is on Ravelry, by the way, um, <laughs> um, has three different collar options. So they love the turtleneck collar on me so i'm never going to wear anything else on mm -hmm. <laughs> on camera again <laughs> but um because uh, i know what my chin looks like without it um i have no shame my my chins are an open display <laughs> yo honey i used to be 450 pounds i know in fact on february 13th i'm gonna do a 20th anniversary marathon for the date of my wow. bariatric surgery that's awesome congratulations mm. well thank you thank you i know i i hope you'll be there that would be fun um anyway um so yeah this thing i used to call it the sweater that would not die because it took me so long to figure out the design mm -hmm. in the first place i have i have 
different kinds of I have three different kinds of cables on the front wow. panel. And the counting for that is a nightmare. <laughs> Just trying to get it right. Um, and then the the back panel and then the sleeves. The sleeves are not right. I I'll wear it in public, but you know, I I couldn't share it with anyone else. Um I have another version in another yarn that, that one of my viewers very kindly sent me with a, a modified sleeve that looks yeah. a lot better, but it's the awesome. same front panel with the, the different mm -hmm. kind of cables because I've got a, a braided cable here. Wow. I've got uh, one for oops, one variety of a rope cable there. Mm -hmm. and a different kind of rope cable there and then um it was somewhat complex so it took no, a little, it looks little bit of planning i love that kind of stuff i tried knitting once it, it didn't jive with me <laughs> no. knitting knitting is still a mystery to me and i'm okay with that because Believe you me, there's still a lot to learn with crochet that mm -hmm. I haven't learned yet. So I'm okay with just leaving knitting as it is. Yeah. But um, um, uh, I didn't mean to get off on this tangent talking about myself, but I can talk yeah, about myself all day long. Hey, me too. <laughs> um, uh, how do we get started on this topic? patterns we were talking uh, about selling our work not gonna do it yeah no i would rather give it away than sell it yeah and honestly it's probably better done that way um especially if it's to the right audience yeah yeah i don't think goodwill is the right audience <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got a bunch of, of blankets <laughs> and sweaters and things or quilts that um, you would like to give away, then I think a homeless organization yeah. is much better than Goodwill. Because at yeah. Goodwill, someone's going to come along they're going to find it. They're going to say, oh, I could use that yarn. And then they'll frog the whole thing. Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 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 anyway. So, so we've been talking for well over an hour now. Who would have thought it? I know, right? As I've certainly enjoyed every bit no, of it. Same here. So we should probably close pretty soon. So what would you like to leave our viewers with? What would I like to leave your viewers with? Um, just be yourself. You know, accept yourself. Um, embrace it. And, and just magic will happen. So. And praise the Lord, of course. I'm the gay church lady. Ah! Praise the Lord and, and you know, pass the lasagna. <laughs> no, no, pass, pass the hot dish. Hot dish if you're from Minnesota. Hot dish. Uh, oh, now there, don't you know. I live there yeah, 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I spent a good part of my childhood in Minnesota. So they know I, how to make a good hot dish. Oh, yeah. Oh, Amy yeah. Amy Tater rather... Tot Hot Dish. Google that. <gasps> oh, at, to to this day, tater tot casserole is one of my love favorites. Love I love it. to make it, and, so and you know when I was there in the mid seventies, late sixties through the mid seventies, um, I mean it sounds like a joke, but it's true. Seasonings were salt, pepper, and ketchup. Oh, it still is. <laughs> Actually, no. When I I haven't lived there for 12 years. So towards the end of the time I lived there, it, people were getting more awake to flavors. It actually has a very vibrant food scene. Well, I, well, depending upon where you are, in the also, Twin Cities. but I love 
the Twin Cities. Yeah. But yeah, and so the places like the Twin Cities, Rochester, Duluth, they're mm -hmm. getting a more international yeah. um, population now. So they're getting more flavors. But also, you know, when, when I was there, diversity was having Swedes and Norwegians in the same room. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. No, it's um, one thing I really admire about the Twin Cities and the Lutheran community, particularly there, is how much advocacy they did in, in helping refugees come to our country. Um, the Hmong community, you know, the Hill Tribes people that we screwed over in, in Laos and, and, um, and Vietnam and Cambodia, you know, there's a huge community there. Some of my closest friends when I lived there were Hmong. Um, mm. and, and, and I look at the Somalian community as well. Like those church ladies, they, they, did, they did Christianity for that portion at least. I think they did it right in helping other people. I have seen that in a lot. Well, I, actually all over the country and a lot of local congregations yeah. i have a very good friend from undergrad days who is just now at our age completing a doctorate mm -hmm. um uh and her topic her dissertation topic has to do with diversity studies diversity inclusion um and and refugees mm -hmm. and um her own family um, came over in the 19th century mm -hmm. as even though they were Northern Europeans, they were still refugees. Mm -hmm. And even and in those days, just the fact they were refugees, it didn't matter if they were also Northern Europeans. Mm -hmm. They were still refugees. And I, re well, I don't remember, but I know of the days when you know there were like signs on the doors you know help wanted irish need not apply mm -hmm. that sort of thing yeah um um so um, you know the signs might not be posted that way anymore but the signs are still there of course they are of course so. they are so yeah and um as far as the lutherans go i i most I have a very long history with church music. Um, and most of my experience is Anglican music. Okay. And a lot of it is in uh, in Manhattan, in um, a part of town where there were a lot of retirees and SROs, you know, single room occupancy hotels, mm -hmm. where they would like, they would be lucky if they could pay less than a thousand dollars a month for a yeah. single room um and um there was a lot of ministry there going on mm -hmm. but there was also um the acceptance there but also uh but then i wound up when i moved to Oh, several a number of years later i wound up living in the suburbs and then i was the very last church job i ever had was in a lutheran church they were the most loving people That's most awesome. loving church people i have ever yeah. met you, you know as much as i've bad mouth church ladies <laughs> or whatever you want to say I think they're the minority of Christians. Um, I think. Well, I mean, just, there's a difference between think church they, ladies they, and church Karens. Yes, because because I think that the I think the the bad Christians or the people who are very judgy and mean and and make the rest of us look down on the rest of us. I don't think they're the majority in most congregations. I think they're the most vocal, and I think that there are a lot of good people in communities of faith that's so. a thing about this country where a very vocal minority is allowed to hold sway mm -hmm. um that's over 
the vast majority of people. Like Amy, what's her name on the Supreme Court? Or or who's that Senator Cinema or whatever her name is from Arizona? I mean, it's just it's mind boggling. But uh, yeah, it well, yeah, whatever. It, it is what it is. And you know, we can't fix it tonight. No. Nope. Um, nope. But we can sure talk about it. Yep. Um, but we don't need to talk about it at length <laughs> right now. Anyway, um, so um, I'm going to um, click end recording, okay. but do you stick around. Cause sure. Thanks so much for having me on. Appreciate more it. to talk about. And then, um, um, and then, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we'll talk more. I'll have more information in the description for our viewers. Okay. Uh, to be able to reach you, to be able to see your beautiful work. Well, which you. we, I, I feel like we haven't really touched on your work enough because we've talked about so many other fascinating things. Um, and then. But, um, but to me, like, we have talked about my work because my work is about social justice and. And it is about my journey to accept and reclaim my cultural heritage. So, so while I hear what you're saying, I think we, well, to me, I can't separate my work from my story. So, I understand that, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I acknowledge yeah. what you're saying, and I think that it's completely true. Um, Okay, anyway, so for all of our viewers, I want to thank you very much for keeping up with us all this time. Um, if you're still here, please like, subscribe, comment, share, all the standard YouTube crap, and keep coming back. See you, everybody.